Welcome to the Revival Animal Health webinar on newborn puppy care, managing neonates and high-risk puppies. We are so excited today to have Dr. Marty Greer, Director of Veterinary Services at Revival Animal Health joining us. Dr. Greer has more than 35 years of experience in veterinary medicine with special interests in pediatrics and reproduction. In this webinar, Dr. Greer will provide resources to measure the health of newborn puppies and strengthen the overall health of neonates. In addition, we hope you will leave with the necessary tools to improve neonatal survival outcomes when puppies are in trouble. So now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Marty Greer. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, and I'm happy to be here. Um, and there's lots of places we still need to go, so we'll, we'll catch up. All right, so if I could advance my slides, we'd be all set. All right, so I'm gonna start off with a question, a couple of questions. First question is, can you whelp and raise 100% of your newborn puppies? Two, can you prevent diarrhea in your puppies? And if the answers to this are both yes, then I guess we probably don't need, you probably don't need to be on the, the call, but I'm guessing that most of you have at some point, at least some issues with your puppies that you'd like to um, ask for help with. So we're gonna go through this. Um, so we're gonna go through first, what can we manage? So we're gonna talk about identifying high-risk puppies. What do we measure? What can we manage? And then we'll talk about breathing, temperature, dipping cords, feeding, formula, passive immunity, and go from there. Um, now, this chart is much too small for you to read, and I don't expect you to read it, but Shelly has this as a handout that she can send out, or maybe she already has, um, to the participants. So this is going to go through some of the parameters that we're going to talk about measuring today. So we're going to go through these one at a time. Don't get alarmed if you can't read everything, because we will have this sent out to you. So the first thing we want to do is identify our high-risk puppies. And to do that, we're going to use the APGAR score birth weight, litter size, and 4-H syndrome. So my first question to you is, what is an APGAR? <clears throat> and some of you may know this, uh, especially those of you with a medical background, you may already know what APGAR is, but some of you may not. And I think it's a really important number that we learn how to use because it's going to be very useful in assessing puppies. Now, clearly this is a human baby, not a puppy, but uh, APGAR scores were developed back in the 1950s by this incredible woman who was a ped pediatrician and I think she ran anesthesia for C-sections. This is back in the day when our mothers were anesthetized for us to be born so that they didn't go through natural childbirth. But her name is Virginia APGAR. So Virginia Apgar developed this really cool scale named after herself. I think it was pretty brilliant. And in the 1950s, very few women were physicians. So I think it's truly a testament to her um, abilities that she was able to develop a score that is still with us today. So if any of us that were born, now I'm 63, if any of you were born in the 1950s and more recently than that, you have had an Apgar score applied to you. So APGAR on the human side stands for APGAR. A is appearance. So in dogs, we call that mucous membrane color. Uh, P is for pulse or heart rate. G is for grimace. And of course, puppies don't grimace the way babies do. So we look for irritability reflexes. A, the second A is activity or mobility. And this, the R is for respirations. So we score five different parameters on a scale of zero, one, and two. And it's scored twice, once at one minute after birth, and then again, five minutes after birth. So what uh, Dr. Um, Rut Kutzritz, who is the theriogenologist on staff at University of Minnesota did, was converted the APGAR scores used on human babies to the veterinary side. So this is a chart, again, that's in your notes, and it gives you a chance to score your puppies at the time of birth, whether they're born by vaginal birth or by C-section. It's a really great tool to assess how vigorous your puppies are at birth. So if you have a zero APGAR score, you're probably either deceased or pretty close to it and it may be difficult to resuscitate. If the puppy comes out screaming, moving, good heart rate, good pink color membranes, and breathing regularly, it's gonna have a score of a 10. So you can get a score anywhere between zero and 10 depending on how vigorous or uh, not vigorous a puppy is. So we know heart rates should be above 220. 
Uh, we know that they should be actively moving. We know they should be crying shortly after they're born. They should be, have pink mucous membranes and they should have good, strong respirations. Some puppies will have some irregular respirations for the first few minutes. That's not unusual, but again, that's going to drop their APGAR score from a 10, maybe to a 9, maybe to a 7. And what's important about this is the people at NeoCare, which is the vet school in the south of France in Toulouse, has taken some of these uh, scores and they've quantified them into numbers that we can use for some real life information. So we know puppies that have an APGAR score of below seven have a 22 fold increased risk of death in the first eight hours after birth. And we know puppies with, with a four to seven APGAR score, so in that mid range, so that they're weak but not. Um, deceased at birth, have a 90% survival rate if we intervene with appropriate intervention. So we're going to talk about what those interventions look like, the, some things that you can do at home and some things that can be done at the veterinary clinic. In our veterinary clinic, when we do C-sections, all of our puppies are identified at birth by a colored towel. Now, when the surgeon does the C-section, they have to remain with sterile gloves. So we sterilize a set of colored towels that we hand to the technicians as they resuscitate the puppies. So each puppy is going to be born and handed off into a technician's colored towel. And that way, in our veterinary clinic, we can track a number of things. We can track their APGAR score. We can track the resuscitation efforts that we have to provide. And we can um, track their position in the uterus. And I think it's interesting to know that if you've got multiple puppies that are next to each other in the uterus, that there was a deceased puppy and then there were some things not too healthy, those are important things for you to know as well when you take these puppies home. It's a lot harder to know what their uterine position is when they were born by vaginal birth. You know who what their birth order is, but it doesn't tell us if it was the right horn or the left horn that they were born from. So it can be harder to tell when they're born by vaginal birth, but you can still use this information. The reason we have colored towels is number one, so that they can be sterile, but number two, they can be identified. So if we have a litter of 16 puppies, and we do sometimes, we'll be able to track where the puppy was, what the resuscitation efforts were, who resuscitated them, what their APGAR score was at birth, and, and the other information that a client needs as a pet owner to take these puppies home and be able to intervene and keep their puppy survival rates high. Now you'll notice there's also a matching bottle of fingernail polish laid on each towel, and it took my staff about an hour one afternoon when they were kind of bored to decide what colors they were going to name each towel. So we have this all set up and it's pretty nice for them to be able to see um, how their puppies were resuscitated and what went on. So then once they go home, they're marked with fingernail polish or ID bands so that we have a way that we can permanently identify them. And then that information can be transferred onto a puppy tracking sheet. You can use a puppy tracking sheet on your computer. You can use it in a spiral notebook with a pen and a, and a uh, ruler so that you can draw your lines. But with information like the APGAR scores, the weights, the temperatures, urine color, and some of the other parameters that we're going to talk about measuring, with or without an Excel spreadsheet, as a pet owner, you can very effectively track how your puppies are doing, what kind of success rate they're having, and what you need to do for intervention. Back in the day before we had cell phones and everybody had a camera in their pocket, I had clients that would draw their markings on their puppies. This was a Springer Spaniel breeder that I borrowed this from. Um, clearly, if you have all Samoyeds or you have all yellow labs, it can be a lot harder to identify which puppy is which because you don't have markings. But in Springers and uh, Pointers and all the other breeds that have markings, this is a useful tool as well. So the first parameter we want to measure is going to be APGAR score. The second parameter is birth weight. So I prefer weighing puppies on a scale that has a digital readout that includes grams as well as ounces because grams are much smaller increments and we can see weight gain and weight loss much more readily on a gram version than we can on an ounce version. So please uh, realize that a lot of these scales you can flip back and forth so you can actually record both weights. So from the Neo care information in the south of France, we also know that low birth weight puppies, like low birth weight babies, have a greater risk. And in puppies, it's an 81% greater chance of death in the first 48 hours if they're low birth weight puppies. And we know from that study that puppies in the lightest 25% of their breed have an increased risk of mortality in the first two days. And weight loss, most puppies lose some weight when they're first born. We used to say up to a 10% weight loss was acceptable, but now we know anything more than 4%, which is a pretty small amount, can have an eightfold increased risk of death. 
So with all this information about birth weight, it's really important that we record and that we track this information. Now, I had a client a number of years ago that had bred his first and I believe only litter. And he called me one afternoon and he said, you know, Dr. Greer, I'm a little bit worried about these two puppies because they're not gaining weight the way the other ones are. And he sent me numbers that were 72% and 81%, sent me these numbers of weight gain. And I'm like, this is a little weird, but I knew he was an engineer and I knew he worked at GE, General Electric in the engineering department. And I said, so John, do you have an Excel spreadsheet for this? And he goes, yeah. How'd you know? And I said, well, it's okay to tell me that you have an Excel spreadsheet because this is really good information. And I looked at this and as you can see really readily from the graph that he put together, in the first week after birth, he had yellow puppy and white puppy, which were not doing very well. They weren't gaining at the same rate that everybody else was. And obviously black puppy is quite a tank here. I said to him, you know, John, I think these two puppies are in trouble. And he said, yeah, I'm a little worried about them. So I said, why don't you come up? So he packed everybody up in the car and he brought them up and we looked at the puppies and we found that yellow puppy and white puppy had become septic at some point in their first few days of life. And each of them had sloughed a toe off of their back foot. Now, John was a really smart guy. He was an engineer, but he never had children and he never raised a litter of puppies. And he didn't realize that he had something as bad going on as he did. So we were able to get our hands on these puppies and with some intervention with antibiotics and some supportive care, we were able to save the whole litter. But this is the kind of information that you're going to find very useful when you call your veterinary clinic and say, hey, you know what? I think we might have a little bit of a problem here. This is what I have for numbers. So we want to make sure that your veterinary clinics have access to the same data that you do. Litter size is the third parameter and we can not control APGAR scores at birth. We cannot control birth weight. We can't control litter size. Along the way, you will find some things that we can control. But we know in large litters, again, they have a fourfold increased risk of neonatal death because of low birth weight puppies. So you would tend to have you know, 14 puppies that are smaller than if you had six puppies. But they're also going to be slower in the delivery of those puppies. So by the time you get to puppies number seven, eight, nine, and 10, you may have some increased risk of death because they've had a slower time coming out of the uterus and they've been oxygen deprived during some of that time that the uterus was contracting and they were traveling through the uterus and out um, vaginally or at C-section. So we know large litters have an increased risk of uh, mortality. And then we have 4-H syndromes. This is the last four things that we can measure. And those are going to be hypothermia, which is low body temperature, hypoglycemia, which is low glucose or low sugar, C is hydration or dehydration, and then D is hypoxia or low blood oxygen. So hypothermia or chilled puppies have ileus of the gut. Ileus of the gut means that when they're chilled, their intestinal tract stops moving and digesting. So instead of digesting the food, the food tends to foam up in the GI tract and puppies tend to aspirate. They also tend to dehydrate because they're not absorbing fluid from the intestinal tract. And when that's happening, their blood glucose is dropping. So these things are all really intertwined with each other. Not one stands alone. If you have a chilled puppy, you have this cascade of events that starts to happen that needs to have intervention. So I recommend that our bitches are at room temperature at around 75 degrees in the room, but the surface temperature where the puppies are kept should be between 90 and 95 degrees for the first week with a drop after that. The rectal temperature on a puppy in their first 24 hours after birth should be 94 to 96 degrees. But after the first week, it should go up to 96 to 98, and then it goes up one degree a week until they get to a normal body temperature of 101 when they're about four to five weeks old. So we know chilled puppies have a fourfold increased risk of death. So chilling is really bad. How do we tell if they're chilled? Well, we use a thermometer. Digital thermometers are the best. The shakedown mercury kind are kind of a thing of the past. And a rectal temperature on a puppy should be 96 to 98 degrees before they nurse or before you feed them. So all it takes is a rectal thermometer, and you can buy these usually at Walmart or at Revival. But right now, it's pretty tough to buy any thermometers with COVID because everybody's already snapped them up. And then, of course, Vaseline. Now, even the smallest two-ounce puppy can ma man manually, you can put a thermometer in those puppies if it's well lubricated. So don't be afraid to take the temperature on a puppy, even if it seems like a really, really little puppy. So how do we measure low blood sugar? Well, we can use a glucometer, just like the glucometers that are used for diabetic patients to monitor blood glucose. So you can use a glucometer. Pet Test makes one that's sold by Revival that's meant for dogs and cats. 
And um, it's simple to do. You just take the little um, lancet and you poke the bottom of a foot pad and you collect one little tiny drop of blood, put it onto the strip, put it into the monitor, and very quickly you can read a blood glucose out. A normal blood glucose in a puppy should be 90 or higher. If it's lower than that, we need to make sure that this puppy is warm and being fed adequately because, again, we have a fourfold increased risk of death when we have a glucose that's that low. The third thing we want to monitor for is dehydration. The third H is hydration or dehydration. Room humidity should be between 55% plus or minus 10%. So 45, 55 to 65% should be normal room humidity. And you can monitor hydration in puppies with whether their mucous membranes or their gums feel moist and the color of their urine. Now, a lot of you are familiar with checking hydration in adult dogs and cats by pinching the skin on the back of their neck and watching how quickly it goes down. Unfortunately, that doesn't work well in puppies because they don't have some of the subcutaneous fat that adult dogs and cats do. So you wanna check hydration by the urine color. Urine color should be very pale, almost clear colored after their first urination. So all it takes is a cotton ball or white tissue and you can very easily stimulate the puppy's perineum and collect a urine sample. Even if mom has recently licked the puppy, you'll usually be able to collect some urine. If you contaminate it with fecal material, of course, it's gonna look more yellow. So make sure you just collect urine. On the females, it's a little trickier to get just urine than it is on the males. And the fourth thing we can measure, although not very well effectively at home right now, is hypoxia. We can use a pulse oximeter, like the little thing that the doctor puts on your finger when you go to the doctor's office to check your O2. We can do that on dogs in the veterinary clinic. Someday we'll be able to do this in homes as well. We'll be able to find some of these pieces of equipment that are effective and affordable enough for you to use at home. Right now, the ones we have are pretty expensive. The inexpensive ones, I've purchased a couple off of eBay that are in the $100 range. And unfortunately, they are not accurate. I've tried them on my anesthetized patients, comparing them to the $3,000 piece of equipment, and it's just not accurate enough. So we'll talk about the things that we can do for all these different changes. So what can we measure? APGAR scores, oxygenation, their body weight and their weight gain, their urine color, which measures hydration, their body temperature, which measures hypoxia, and their glucose, which measures hypoglycemia. So those are the things that we can measure. So now that we have a measure, okay, what do I do about it? Like, I know that they're hypoxic or I know that they're hypoglycemic. What do I do? So we're going to go through that. So we're going to talk about the things you can measure, which would be breathing, temperature, dipping cords, feeding, formula, and passive immunity. So breathing, of course, is the first A when you go through the ABCs of CPR. The first thing we want to do is make sure that the puppy is breathing by getting the membranes off of their face, and then we'll go through the rest of these items, the daily mucus trap, the bulb syringe, and some of the other interventions. So the first thing we need to do is get the membranes off the puppy's face. If it's coming head first, you can clear those membranes before it's all the way out, unless mom beats you to it. Uh, if they're coming out back end first, you want to get their um, back end out and then the face turned as fast, fast as you can and the membrane's cleared. And then you can kind of get out of the way and let mom do some of the work. Sometimes you'll have bitches that are very effective at this and they're right on it. Um, my farm dog, her first litter, she did all by herself. The farm dog that I just had puppies with on Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, not a clue. Well, she kind of knew, but she doesn't really like her puppies. So we'll talk about you know, how we intervene with that as well. But I had to be there to help with the first puppy being born, the second puppy she did pretty well with, third puppy not so much. So you may find that you need to be home and be available up in the middle of the night or home from work when these puppies are being born so that you don't lose puppies. So like any other critical patient, once we clear the membranes, we wanna make sure that they have an open airway, that they're breathing, that they have a heartbeat, and that they're dry and warm, the A, B, Cs, and Ds. So once the membranes are off the face, you can intervene with a daily mucus trap. Here are pictures of Alyssa and Heidi using the daily mucus traps on bulldog puppies. These are very simple to use. They're very inexpensive. They run just a little over $10. We do carry them at Revival. And you can very quickly and very effectively suction fluid out of the puppy's airway with these dealies. Uh, so all you do is put one end in your mouth, the other end goes in the puppy, and it's really intuitive to use these. You really can't use them wrong. They're sort of like a McDonald's straw. All you do is put one end in your mouth, the white piece goes in your mouth, the other piece goes in the puppy's mouth, and it's very soft and pliable, and then you just gently move it around in the back of the puppy's throat 
not all the way down into their stomach, just enough to clear the fluid. Now I combine a daily mucus trap with a bulb syringe and I have good success with alternating back and forth. I think the bulb syringe does a nice job with thick mucus and I think the daily does a better job with clear watery fluid. Now, when you're using a daily mucus trap, you want to be careful. This is Heather using her daily mucus trap. And you can see she's smiling because she stopped suctioning before the fluid level got up to the tube that would call make this daily mucus trap called a straw. So you want to stop when the fluid chamber gets no more than half full and drain the fluid out of it. You just pop the lid off, dump it down the drain, put it back together, and then suction again. Or you will have the opportunity to taste the um, wonderful placental fluids that your puppy was born with. I don't recommend it. They're salty, by the way. So like I said, I use a bulb syringe, squeeze it so that it's already compressed when you put it in the puppy's mouth, and then release it when it's in the back of the throat. Alternating a daily mucus trap with a bulb syringe is a very effective way of clearing fluid out of the back of the puppy's throat and getting them to start breathing. At that point, if they're still not breathing effectively and you have available oxygen or an oxygen concentrator, this is the time to start using it. You want to use a heat source under the puppy to keep the puppy warm and provide oxygen at the same time. This is an oxygen concentrator. We again carry these at Revival Animal Health. These take room air, which is 20% oxygen, and with the wonders of medical technology, turns it into 95% oxygen. So without having to go out and buy an oxygen tank and worrying about it running out at two o'clock in the morning, you have access to full 95% um, oxygen with this device uh, that very effectively can deliver oxygen to one puppy or to a group of puppies if you put them in an incubator. And again, like I said, we have a pulse oximeter. We can use this at the veterinary hospital, but we don't have these at home for home use yet. So if we have the puppy's airway cleared and we've got the membranes off and the puppy's still not breathing, the next step we're gonna do is use the 25 gauge needle. And right where this little Bernie's Mountain Dog has the X on the front of the nose is where you're gonna insert the needle. We use a small gauge, 25 gauge needle, and that's my preference. But if you don't have that smaller one, anything a little bit bigger would be fine. And the reason that this works is this is acupuncture point GV26. And with some stimulation in this area, many times we can get a puppy to take a breath. So for those of you who vaccinate your own dogs and you've ever uncapped a needle and then as you were pulling it off, you jammed yourself back in the lip at the same time with a nice clean needle and you've said some kind of bad four letter word because you just jammed yourself in the lip you will know that that's an acupuncture point for making you take a deep breath so this does work effectively if you have a newborn that's not breathing if they're still not breathing at that point and this this shows i'm sorry let me see if i can get this video to play um this will show using the needle so you can either kind of peck or you can twist it you can hear the puppy crying. You can see it's turning pink. So this is how the acupuncture point is used. It goes in about an eighth of an inch, right to the bone. So that's GV26. If at that point you still don't have the puppy breathing, you can use caffeine. And for this, we use caffeine tablets. We use Nodos, which again, you can buy without prescription. If you don't have these, you can use um, Five Hour Energy, the liquid and put a drop of that on the puppy's tongue. So caffeine can be used as a respiratory stimulant and it can be used every couple of hours if necessary to keep the puppy breathing regularly. So we just dissolve a tablet of no-dose in one cc of tap water, keep it in a syringe, and then use that if we need to, uh, to keep puppies breathing. If push comes to shove, you've done everything, you've cleared the airway, you've used caffeine, you've used acupuncture point, GV26 and you're at home and you don't have any other way that you can resuscitate the puppy. Some people use Dopram. Dopram is a respiratory stimulant. It is highly controversial on the human and the veterinary side because at the same time that it's expecting your brain um, to breathe, it's also increasing the brain's need for oxygen. So there is some controversy in the use of this, but we have used it on some puppies, even though it says not for use in neonates. It's the only product that we can use that's on the market. And we do have puppies that I know are alive today that would have not survived if we hadn't used Dopram on them. But you have to wait at least 10 minutes and you have to have cleared all the airways and done all the other good stuff before you do this. Like I said, it's controversial. It can be injected right into the tongue. And I will send a dose or two of this home with clients if they're going to be whelping at home. But it is an absolute last resort. 
Along with that, we can keep the puppy's tilted head down to help fluid to continue to drain. If you're at the veterinary clinic, intubation can be performed so we can place an, an endotracheal tube in the puppy's airway and ventilate the puppy. And again, um, uh, the, this is only done at a veterinary clinic. And I will tell you that if you take chocolate chip cookies or in Lynn Sell's case, French silk pies to the veterinary staff, they will learn how to put intubation tubes into your puppy. So if you should have a tragedy and lose a puppy, take that puppy with you, take it to the vet clinic, ask your vet techs if they will practice intubation. And with being able to place an endotracheal tube using a laryngoscope or an otoscope, if they can get a tube down a puppy's trachea and get the puppy started breathing, it can make a huge difference in puppy survival. So using an endotracheal tube and an ambu bag or an anesthetic machine, we can ventilate these puppies. And if we can get them to take the first two or three breaths, then they'll oftentimes take off and start breathing on their own. Now, of course, at home, you're not going to have access to these things. So if the absolute last resort you have is to take a bulb syringe, and instead of suctioning with it, use it as a little bit of a bulb to ventilate the puppy. You can seal it at the back of the throat, puff it a couple of times, and see if you can get that puppy to take a couple of breaths. Again, like I said, if you can get the first couple of breaths into them, um, many times they'll take off and start breathing on their own. The first breath is the hardest breath for any new patient to take, whether it's a cow or a horse or a baby or puppy. So once the first couple of breaths are taken, then they spread surfactant through the alveoli of the lungs and they'll start to breathe on their own spontaneously. So I know people will also put their mouth around the puppy and breathe for them. Um, I've done that myself. I prefer not to, but if that's the only choice you have, then it's absolutely worth doing. This is also called the One Puff Kit. I have not had great success with this. It's supposed to be an aspiration and a, and a ventilation unit. It works really well on the calves and horses that I've used it on, but I haven't had great success with it on the dog side. So I would be teaching my vet techs to put those trach tubes in. And back in the old days, and I've been in practice for a long time, we used to swing puppies. We used to use swinging as a technique to try and clear the fluid out of the airway. That was before we had Dealey mucus traps. But we know that if we overswing a puppy and cause brain damage, that we can cause uh, bleeds in the brain, just like shaken baby syndrome. So we do not recommend swinging anymore. And the last thing that you should do if you're still working on this puppy at home is grab your stethoscope. And I would encourage everyone to have a $10 stethoscope at their house and listen to the puppy's heart to see if you can hear a heartbeat. And if you see a, um, the curled pink tongue and a, you hear a heartbeat, you want to keep working on that puppy as long as you can until the next puppy comes so that you have an opportunity to get these puppies breathing. And then, like I said, giving them oxygen once you've got them started breathing with the puppy warmer. Um, this is their other version of their oxygen concentrator. They make two. These are very effective. Um, and these are great tools for you to have at home to help with ventilating puppies. While you're doing all this, you want to keep them safe so they don't fall off the table. You want to keep them warm. In our veterinary practice, we use these gift wrap trays. This was a litter of 16 puppies. Swifty had these. And um, she had 16 puppies, and you can see how they're all lined up and rolled up into their towels so we can keep track until we can get their umbilical cords tied off and treated with uh, betadine and then put into the incubator. So this is how our practice looks during a 16-puppy C-section. Again, we have the incubator that um, Puppy Warmer makes. Revival Animal Health sells this. So you can use this along with the oxygen concentrator to keep the puppies warm and to keep the oxygen levels high enough. These are very precise. These are developed by a really great thermal engineer that has now quit his job as a thermal engineer. And his full-time job now is building Puppy Warmer uh, incubators and Puppy Warmer oxygen concentrators because people are buying these like crazy. Um, they're really working out well for a lot of our breeder clients. I had one at home when my last litter was born on Wednesday, and I'll tell you, I was really glad I did because I needed the heat and I needed the oxygen to get these guys going. Now, um, the other thing that I make sure of is that we have an adequate heat source after the puppies are born. I want room temperature, like I said before, not to be any warmer than 75 degrees, but I like the surface temperature to be closer to 90. Now, I use that from heating from underneath. This is my litter of 10 corgi puppies that I had a number of years ago. That's the T.E. Scott whelping nest you can see in the background. It's that black disc that looks like a walk. And I didn't put the puppies on the walk. There are 10 puppies there. Five of them are on the walk. Five of them are not. 
just depending on what their thermal preference is. So we know puppies want to pick their own temperature. We don't want to have them all at one uniform temperature. So they need to have areas that are cooler and areas that are warmer. Um, and this particular device is made by T.E. Scott. You build it into a whelping box. It's run on electricity, but there are some companies that are now making them with other heat sources, um, such as propane for the um, Amish and the Mennonite that may not have access to electricity. So these are great devices. A heat lamp can heat up the room too much. It can make the mother too hot. She won't want to stay with the puppies. It can heat the puppies to the point that they dehydrate. And I set our barn on fire one time with a heat lamp. So I'm a little bit heat lamp leery and very, very fond of my T.E. Scott whelping nests. Every single litter I've ever had at my own house and that I've raised for other people have been raised on this device. Um, they last years and years and years, so don't hesitate to spend the money and build a nice box for these. So like I said before, we want a thermometer and Vaseline so we can take the temperature. And we want to make sure as soon as we get the cords tied off or the bitch bites them off and they're not bleeding, that we adequately dip the cord with tincture of iodine. The tincture of iodine is a combination of iodine and alcohol. And when I say dip the cord, I really mean dip the cord. It means totally surround the cord with iodine. Don't just kind of mist a little bit at it. You want a complete circle around it. And what this does is it prevents an infection from ascending up the umbilical cord while it's wet and fresh and into the puppy's abdomen. Um, I did lose a puppy of my own at one point. I was using chlorhexidine instead of tincture of iodine, and I was very sad that I lost the puppy. Um, she was fine at 2 o'clock in the morning, and at 4 o'clock in the morning, she was dead. So it can happen really fast. So be aware of that. The next thing we want to do is make sure that we're providing adequate nutrition for our newborns. Now, this picture is a picture of Lily, who was making the internet rage a few years ago using a makeup sponge as a feeding device. We absolutely do not recommend this. There's a lot of reasons not to. Number one, they inhale a lot of air. Number two, we don't know what petroleum products are in the makeup sponge. They're going to get fibers and other things. Number three, you can't sterilize it. And number four, you really can't measure how much these puppies are getting. Number five, they're likely to aspirate. So please don't use the makeup sponge feeding technique. Use a bottle, use a tube, but please don't use the makeup sponge. I just have this on here as a reminder that this is not a great idea. So as I said before, we don't want puppies to lose more than 4% of their body weight in their first 24 hours. They should double their birth weight in the first seven to 10 days. And we want to see them gain two to four grams per day per kilogram of anticipated adult body weight. So with some help, you can calculate this. And I'm happy to help you do that if you aren't sure how to make that formula work for you. But basically, puppies should be big when they're born and they should get bigger. They should not have too low a birth weight or the prognosis is less favorable for their survival. Toy breeds are typically one to 200 grams, which is about a quarter of a pound at birth. Large breeds are typically four to 500, which is about a pound and giant breeds are about 700 grams. Dogs like Labradors, Golden Retrievers in that size range, they should gain one to two pounds a week during their weight gain. And again, there are ways to calculate this for other breeds. So don't hesitate to let us know if you want some help with that. So colostrum is the best food that you can feed a puppy, but unfortunately we don't always have access to colostrum for our puppies. Um, we know that there's a correlation between colostrum ingestion and longevity in puppies and in humans. So we wanna make sure that colostrum is ingested by our puppies. Colostrum is the first milk that a bitch has. It's that yellow looking stuff that isn't quite the color of milk. Um, if you can collect colostrum from a bitch in your kennel that has a small litter and plenty of colostrum, you can put this in your freezer and use it for other dogs, other puppies when they're born. This particular dog is a Rottweiler, and she had two puppies, one that was doing very, very well, and one puppy that was not, not thriving. So the owner came in when the puppy was one day old because she was worried that this little puppy wasn't going to do well. But because she was a large female and had only two puppies, she had plenty of colostrum. So I was able to collect 90 cc's, that's three ounces of colostrum from her, we started to feed the puppy with it, and I sent the rest of it home with her. Now, I don't like to see you share colostrum from one kennel to another because I'm concerned that you may, along with that, share infectious diseases. But you can only get colostrum for about the first 12 to 24 hours. It's only absorbed for that short period of time from the intestine. You can see how yellow that is. That is not the color of normal milk, but that is not mastitis. That is a normal color for colostrum. So if you have a generously um, endowed female and not enough puppies to drink all the colostrum, save some, put it in small Ziploc bags in your freezer, label it so that you don't confuse it with some other thing that you've frozen, 
and save it for the next time you have a litter of puppies that needs help. Um, I like feeding with a bottle if the puppy has a strong enough suckle reflex. I like the Medi Nurser. It's more difficult to find than it used to be. It used to be able to get it at Walmart, but it's hard to get now. Um, and I like the Miracle Nipple, but you've got to be a little careful with the Miracle Nipple because it can be easy to feed that too fast. They do come in three sizes. They come in the original, which is this size. They come in a mini for very, very small dogs, and then they come in a large. So they do come in different sizes, but you want the puppy to have a strong enough suckle that they're pulling on the nipple and pulling the syringe barrel down. You don't want to be forcing this down or you're likely to cause aspiration in the puppy. So what do you do if you have a puppy that's too weak or puppies that are too weak and not strong enough to suckle well or take a bottle? Then we talk about tube feeding. And unfortunately, a lot of people feel exactly like this about tube feeding. It scares them. But I will tell you, you will lose more puppies to starvation or dehydration than you will lose to making a mistake tube feeding. There are some tricks here. There are five Ps, sometimes six, to ways that you can tube feed safely. And you wanna do all five of these before you tube feed. The first step is to pre-measure the tube so the tube goes from the tip of the puppy's nose to the last rib and put a mark on it so that you know how far it is. And it's gonna be about 15 or 16 centimeters for most puppies. The second thing you wanna do is pre-warm the puppy and the formula so you don't want a cold puppy. It needs to be at least 94 to 96 degrees and the formula should be warm. And I don't, use a thermometer, I just use my wrist. I'm old school, you know, check the temperature of the formula so it's not too hot, and not too cold. You wanna pass the uh, tube with the chin down. The temptation is to put their head back and that's likely to open up the airway. So keep their chin down and pass it to the left. And then the last thing you do before you push the plunger on the syringe is you pinch either their tail or their toe. And if they can cry, you're in the esophagus, it's safe to feed. If they can't make any sound, you could be in the trachea, pull out the tube, Go get a cup of coffee, take a little break, stop shaking, come back and try it again. The amount that you feed is gonna be one cc per one ounce of body weight. At two o'clock in the morning, you are by yourself. There is no one there to help you with complicated math. So I wanna make this as simple as possible. So a four ounce puppy gets four cc's and an eight ounce puppy gets eight cc's and a 16 ounce puppy gets 16 cc's. It's pretty straightforward. So this is my little Rottweiler, the one that we just milked the colostrum from. And I'm gonna teach this client how to tube feed. So I'm gonna measure the tube. So you go from the last rib to the tip of the nose. This guy's moving around quite a bit. And I would mark the tube, and I've already marked it in this video. So that's why I'm not gonna stop and mark it. There's already a mark on the tube. Then I'm gonna keep the chin down. So really simple, and this is video on our learning center. So if you miss this or wanna see it again at two o'clock in the morning by yourself, you will have us there to show you. So I pulled the tube out and I made the client feed her puppy the colostrum. And again, like I said, that's why this is so yellow. So this is her feeding her little Rottweiler puppy. You can see how nicely he's chomping on the tube. She's swallowing the, as he should be. She's holding the tube so it doesn't dislodge. And she's very slowly feeding this puppy. This is her first time ever holding a syringe and tube to feed a puppy, so she's doing really well. This is one of my clients that drove from Iowa for a C-section, and I told her she wasn't driving back to Iowa with a new litter of puppies without knowing how to tube feed. So she was very excited that she could do it. And this is our little Rottweiler puppy that was the rug puppy, the one that wasn't nursing, the one that we milked the colostrum from. So at eight weeks, can you tell which puppy was the runt and which puppy was the big fat one? Because I can't. And that little runt puppy went on at nine months of age to win best puppy in show at the local shows in Fond du Lac. So remember that little runt puppy may not be a throwaway puppy. There may be absolutely nothing wrong with them other than they didn't get a good start. So please, please, please use your tube feeding, be brave, follow the instructions, pull up the video. And with these five steps, you can very safely tube feed a puppy. So don't be afraid to do it. Just make sure you kind of teach yourself to do it. And once you've accomplished it, you're gonna feel really wonderful about how great a job you've done saving puppies. All you need to tube feed a puppy is gonna be a feeding tube, a syringe to put the formula in, a marker so that you know how far to pass the tube, a rectal thermometer so you know how warm the puppy is before you feed, and a scale so you know the volume. So these are all very simple things for you to have around the house. You shouldn't have a whelping without some of these supplies, all these supplies available.
And in my house, nobody starves to death. There's a lot of reasons you can lose puppies. Unfortunately, we have too high percentage of puppies that we lose. So at my house, nobody starves to death. Everybody gets fed. We also have the Breeder's Edge Nurture Mate Paste. It's a colostrum substitute. So it's a bovine colostrum source that can help uh, if you have puppies that aren't getting adequate nutrition. And then if we have puppies that get as old as 12 days or older, and you don't have enough milk from the mom because she's got mastitis or she's sick or she's got 14 puppies and she can't feed them adequately, you can fall back on the starter moose by this age. Now, I try not to wean quite this young. These are collie puppies that are 12 days old. You can't really tell because they're collie puppies, but their eyes aren't open yet. And this is the first time they've seen food. Mom was sick. She had mastitis. She came in with this huge litter of puppies, and they were pretty worried that they weren't going to be able to feed everybody. So we got out a very, very flat plate. This is Corel. We got the food out on the plate. And if you can teach them to get their chin up over the edge of the plate and not step in it, then they can start eating the solid food pretty fast. And it is remarkable how fast that these puppies go from 12 days not doing anything to 14 days eating like little champs. So if you need to do this, have some Royal Canin starter moose on hand. You can usually get these at the pet store. In, they come in little three packs, um, sort of cellophane together like a silo. But this is, again, something you should have on hand, and we do carry this at Revival. The next thing I want to talk about is passive immunity and plasma. Plasma um, is the fluid part of blood that isn't clotted. And by giving this as a substitute for colostrum, we can very successfully save sick puppies or keep puppies from getting sick if mom doesn't have any colostrum because she's sick or because she didn't make colostrum or because something tragic happened to mom. So colostrum is, a, is the best formula, but if you don't have access to it, then plasma or serum is available. You can purchase it from Hemopet. You can also harvest it from large dogs in your kennel, but I usually keep it in stock in our refrigerator and freezer at the clinic because when we need it, we need it right away. And I don't really want to take the time to go collect blood, spin it down, and have to harvest it. The dose is 16 cc's regardless of whether it's a two-ounce puppy or a two-pound puppy. The only difference is how much you can administer at one time. So if you can't administer it all at one time because the puppy's too small, then we divide it into smaller doses. You can give it in the first 24 hours um, at, at any source, including sub-Q. If you're going to give it orally with a feeding tube, you want to give it in the first 12 hours. And it's not going to be well tolerated by a puppy in a bottle. So don't try to bottle feed a puppy this. You want to make sure that you're giving this um, with a feeding tube. And this information was first published in 1992. So this is 22-year-old information. This is not new stuff. Um, we've known about this 32-year information. We've known about this for a long time. So plasma works really well. It comes in bags frozen. It's good for five years in your freezer. You can keep some around in case you need it. And we freeze it in 5.3 cc tubes. So three tubes is 16 cc's. It's very handy for clients to keep at home. They just take it out of the freezer, pop it down their shirt, warm it up at body temperature. And then um, you don't want to microwave it because you'll damage the proteins. And then you just go ahead and feed. Then we're going to talk about treating for the treatable, which will be fluids, glucose, electrolytes, antibiotics, vitamin K, parasite control, and kaopectate. So fluids would be used if you have a puppy that's dehydrated. Um, plasma will also serve as a fluid source, but if you don't have plasma, you can certainly keep saline around the house. You want to keep it as sterile saline that comes in a bag or a bottle. And the dose, again, is one cc for every one ounce of body weight. So again, a very simple calculation. I don't use lactated ringers if I can avoid it because puppies can't metabolize lactate. And I don't give it intraperitoneally into the abdomen. I know there's some veterinarians that do. I've done it in the past. I'm not comfortable doing it. I'm much more comfortable giving it by oral use um, or sub-Q use. So you can use the GI tract orally if the puppy is not vomiting. Um, it does compensate for losses like diarrhea. It will help with dehydration. So if you have a puppy that's not thriving, the first thing you want to do is keep them well hydrated. Remember, the urine color should be very, very pale yellow. If their blood glucose is low or they seem weak, then you can go ahead and give glucose. Um, you can give 5 to 10% glucose, again, which you can purchase. That you want to give orally. You don't want to give this subcutaneously because it's likely to cause an abscess. And again, the dose is 1 cc per 4 ounce. If you don't have anything around the house, Karo syrup will help.
And you can also use Cairo syrup if you have puppies that are constipated. It'll help keep them from being constipated without having to give them any medication. The next thing I want to talk about is electrolytes. Electrolytes are as important for puppies as it is for athletes. This is a great puppy electrolyte source. Um, you can use this for the moms too. This is a chicken soup based flavor. So the puppies really like it. And this is um, also comes as a kitten version if you're a kitten raiser as well. So the puppy light and kitten light can be used very effectively as an oral supplement. They like it, the bitches will drink it, the puppies will drink it. It's a great way to keep puppies hydrated. The next thing we wanna talk about is antibiotics. Now we don't put every puppy on antibiotics. It's really not necessary. It's really not even a good idea. But if you have a puppy that was born with meconium on it, like this puppy has on its shoulders, that's the first fetal stool. When they've been exposed to the first fetal stool, we're concerned about aspiration, pneumonia, and bacterial infections. So all of our puppies that have meconium on them, which is a sign of fetal distress, go home on antibiotics. Number one, they're distressed. Number two, they've potentially aspirated meconium. So we put those all on antibiotics. If you have puppies that are crying uncontrollably, if they're losing toes or tail tips, if they have that blue belly, if you think they're running a fever, if any of those things are happening, then we can use Clavamox, Unison, which is the injectable form of Clavamox, Cephalexin, or Naxel. Naxel is a large animal antibiotic. The advantage to sub-Q injections are that it doesn't mess up their intestinal flora. So that is a better choice than orals if you have access to Naxel. If you don't, orals are better than not using an antibiotic. And subcutaneous injections are actually absorbed better in puppies than intramuscular injections. That's the opposite than in adult dogs, but dogs, puppies don't have great circulation to their muscle. They have better sub-Q circulation, so drugs are better given subcutaneously than intramuscularly. That plus the fact those little puppies, an IM injection just seems like it's hard on them, so I give it subcutaneously. Here's another puppy. This is a white bulldog puppy born with meconium. You can see how yellow that puppy is still attached to the uterus. Our next step, if we've given antibiotics or if we have diarrhea, is we're going to use probiotics. Um, this is a probiotic paste that's really easy to use. It's a lot easier than the capsules and the powders when puppies are very, very young. So you can put a little dab of this on their tongue, they'll swallow it, and then we'll start putting the right bacteria into their GI tract. The next thing would be vitamin K, and that would be used if a puppy is spontaneously breathing, bleeding. Um, if they're bleeding spontaneously from any place, from their oral cavity, from anywhere, um, from an umbilical cord, you can give a vitamin K injection. It can also be used if the puppy is spontaneously breathing af bleeding after a tail dock or dewclaw removal or if they're septic. Many puppies are born vitamin K deficient, so it's not unusual for premature puppies to have some bleeding. The dose is one-tenth of a cc, and this one does go IM, even though everything else goes sub-Q. And we give this for active bleeding, either spontaneous bleeding, tail doctor Duclaw bleeding, or premature puppies that you're concerned about bleeding. Again, plasma will also help with bleeding because it does have clotting factors in it. So if you have a puppy bleeding, this is how you would treat it as vitamin K and plasma. The next thing I want to talk about is parasite control, and I know we've talked about this in previous webinars about treating the moms. So you may have already seen this slide, you may have already seen this information, but puppies are born with roundworms and hookworms, or shortly after birth they're exposed to them through the mammary glands if the female, the mother dog, had parasites when she was a puppy. So you can deworm her and deworm her with every protocol known to man, and she'll still pass those parasites on to her puppies because they insist in her muscles and the stress of pregnancy and lactation reactivate their migration. And they'll migrate through the mammary gland or through the placenta and into the puppies. So you will have puppies born with parasites that by the time they're three weeks old and you can get your first fecal on them are already sick, have belly aches, have diarrhea, aren't gaining well, they're just sick puppies. So rather than waiting for the puppies to get sick and then deworming them, we recommend that you give deworming with Panicure from the third week before whelping through the second week after whelping. So it's a total of five weeks. The label says three days. We know that. But we've been using this protocol for a long time. And if you do this, you don't have to deworm the puppies with Nemex and Parantel at two, four, six, and eight weeks because you've already effectively dewormed them. Again, this was information published in 2002. So again, it's 20-year-old information, not breaking news. We've been using it for a long, long time. And I have clients that have been breeding dogs for 40 years who come through my door and they say, Dr. Greer, 
We have never had such healthy puppies as we have this time. I love this protocol. Now, the girls don't like Panacure very much. It tastes like chalk. So you can mix it with Splenda. You can mix it with peanut butter. You might have to mix it with some things to convince her to take it. The dose is one cc per, 40, for, per four pounds of body weight. So if she's a 12-pound dog, she gets three cc's, and that's once a day for five weeks. The last three weeks of pregnancy through the first two weeks of lactation to keep those migrations of the parasites from causing your puppies to be sick. So that will do roundworms and hookworms and giardia. It won't do coccidia. For coccidia, my preference is Albon. I don't use Pernazaril or some of the others routinely unless I have resistance and I can't get rid of coccidia any other way. Rest assured that almost every breeder at this point has coccidia and giardia at some point during the time they're raising puppies. So we recommend that you give coccidia medication if you show coccidia positive fecals. And we also recommend that you give it for the last three days before the puppies leave your house and send three days home with the puppies at their new home, not because you're selling sick puppies, but because we know from some studies that were done that it stabilizes the intestinal bacteria and it reduces the risk of these puppies picking up parvo at the time that they're stressed and their vaccines aren't fully effective yet and they're being moved from one household to another. So six days of Albon, three days at your house, three days at the new house is the very best way you can do along with vaccinations for parvo to prevent the development of that parvovirus. The next thing I want to talk about is treating diarrhea. And if you do have a problem with diarrhea, you want to use kaopectate. The veterinary, the human kind, is not the same as the veterinary kind. Back in the old days, kaopectate was kaolin and pectin that you bought at the store. But now the stuff you buy for yourself is really the same thing as Pepto-Bismol. It metabolizes into aspirin in the GI tract. So we don't want to use that on our newborns. We don't want to use that on our moms. We want to use kaolin and pectin. We carry this at Revival in a gallon, and we also carry it in a smaller size. So please realize that there is a difference between kaopectate on the human side and kaopectate on the veterinary side. The last thing I want to talk about for an emergency is neonatal ophthalmia. Um, this happens pretty often. Um, it's reported in the literature to only happen in unsanitary conditions, but we had two cases, of this, two different litters of this two weeks ago. Um, one was a mom that had mastitis, and I think she had the same mastitis that the puppies had um, in their neonatal ophthalmia. And basically what happens is that the eyes are still sealed shut. These are puppies under two weeks old, and their eyes are still sealed shut, and they start to develop some swelling behind the eyelids. If that happens, you need to get those eyelids open as soon as possible. If you can do it yourself with a warm washcloth and some gentle traction, go for it. If you can't, get an appointment with your vet today and get in, get them on oral antibiotics and eye drops. If you don't do this, I will guarantee you, you will lose eyes, you'll have blind puppies. We've had too many clients have this happen to them and not realize what was going on. If the puppy's eyes aren't open by two weeks or there's swelling behind the eyelids, get those eyelids open. You are not going to cause harm to their vision by opening them early. You will cause harm by not opening them. And if I even have one puppy with one eye affected in a litter, I open everybody because they're likely to be the next day, the next puppy is going to be affected and the day after that, the third one. So just get them all open at the same time. One of the other great tools we have at Breeders Edge and Revival are the whelping pads. These are good for 300 washes. I use these at my house and they are tremendous. They keep the puppies clean and dry. They have an absorbent side and a non-absorbent side. So you put the absorbent side up. It doesn't allow the fluid to soak through. It keeps the puppies clean and dry and these wash beautifully. They're waterproof. They do a great job. And I absolutely love my whelping pads. So please take a look at these. They come in multiple sizes, depending on what size whelping box you have. The last thing I want to mention is something that I've just learned about in the last year, and that's raccoon latrines. And some of you who are very um, outdoorsy may already know this, but I didn't know this. Um, so raccoons that live out in um, even urban areas, not just rural areas, will, de will develop latrines where they use to go um, everybody goes to to urinate and defecate. So they don't just randomly go somewhere on the lawn, they go to a latrine. They're typically on a tree line or a fence line. And if you're having problems with parvovirus or leptospirosis in your kennel and you can't figure out why, it's probably because somewhere on the perimeter of your property you have a raccoon latrine. The recommendations for managing this if you're having problems, of course, are good hygiene, washing the bitch's feet, feet before she comes back in. Of course, having an elevated whelping pen so that the puppies aren't down on the surface where the, they're so likely to pick up things. But um, 
the Center for Disease Control at this website has a great website. It includes Bailey Ascaris, which is one of the parasites that we see spread by raccoons, but it teaches you how to discover and disinfect raccoon latrines on the perimeter of your property. So if you're having problems, don't just think that vaccination is failing you. If you're having problems with parvo and with lepto, take a look at this website, get your um, hygiene under control, and try to manage this because those little raccoons are just filthy little creatures when it comes to sharing diseases with our dogs and cats. All right, so we also have um, our list of supplies. So this is my typical setup that I keep in a box at my house for when I'm going to whelp. This is our supply list, and again, these are going to be available to you to go back and look at at the Learning Center. So grab your camera and take a picture. You aren't going to write fast enough. Make sure you have all your supplies together before you whelp. These are the drugs and medical equipment and supplies that you'll want to have available so that you're ready to go when whelping happens. This is my current litter of puppies. So this is why I'm currently sleep deprived as little Helga had four puppies between 1.50 and 4.10 in the morning. So of course they never whelp during the day. So this is her new litter. I do want to mention that the AKC has a Bread with Heart program. It's a great educational program for um, health education, accountability, responsibility, and tradition. They do have educational uh, events available on their website, as well as what we have at Revival. And I want to thank everybody for hanging in there and being with us today. Why don't we start? We did have a couple questions regarding glucose. Some people were wondering, can we use a human glucose meter on a puppy? And do you suggest getting blood glucose at home? And if so, how do you get the blood? So yes, you can use the same glucometer, glucose meter on puppies as you use on humans. So if you have a diabetic family member um, that has a glucometer, you can use the same strips and you can use the same meter. They'll typically read a little higher than they, I'm sorry, a little lower than they really are. So if you're getting a 90, it may really be a hundred. And they do that on purpose on the human side, just to make sure that you don't develop hypoglycemia. Um, all you do is take that little um, lancet, that little um, thing that you prick your finger with. You can use that on the foot pad of a puppy. So warm it up first in your hand or with a warm washcloth, get some good blood flow to it, do a little prick on the bottom of the foot. And it takes just a tiny little drop of blood that gets soaked onto that strip and then put into the meter and read right away. So those are results you can have within 60 seconds. And yes, those are things you can do at home. Great answer there. Um, we got a question from Brittany, um, kind of a, a time, <laughs> timely one here. She says she has a listless 5.6 ounce two day old puppy. It's an Aussie female. And she said she's mildly dehydrated. Um, she said she's given her some CC fluid, sub Q, but she's wondering, is there anything else she can do other than putting her on mom? She says she does have a strong sucking reflux. Yeah, so if you think she's not effectively suckling, you can milk some of the milk out from mom and bottle feed her. You can tube feed her. Um, you certainly want to give more fluids. You're, you're, you don't want to overhydrate her because puppies can't tolerate that as well as an adult can if you give too much. But you want to get her hydrated enough that her urine color drops back to that clear yellow or clear, almost no yellow to it, and keep her well fed and warm. So warm her, make, make sure her temperature is fine, make sure she's passing stool normally, and then you can give her a little bit of glucose, a little k syrup orally as well. So those are the things that I would do to support that puppy. But tube feeding is really important for these little guys. And, you know, really, if you don't have the supplies, you need to get them ordered before you have your next litter, and you need to practice doing this so that you're comfortable with it. And that's kind of our last question here, um, kind of has to do with tube feeding. A lot of people asking about that. A, a few people wondering, why do you pass the feeding tube down on the left side of the mouth? And how often should you be tube feeding? You can tube feed every three to four hours, depending on how much the puppy needs and whether they're able to do any nursing. If they nurse some, then you may not need to tube feed quite that often. Um, and if you are tubing like six times a day, I don't go from six times a day to zero times a day. I slowly drop out from six times a day to five and make sure the puppy continues to gain and then to four and make sure it's still gaining and then to three and then to two and then to one. You don't want to just pull the rug out from under a puppy that you've been supporting. The reason we pass to the left is the esophagus is on the left side of the neck and the trachea is more to the right. So by going on the left side, you're less likely to hit the trachea and you're more likely to get it in the esophagus where it should be. So I, I had a family that came in many years ago 
with a litter of beagle puppies, beagles, by the way, beagles. Um, they came in on Easter Sunday and they were losing puppies. They had a female that they bred. I'd never seen them before. Um, they came in because they were losing puppies. And I saw him in the exam room and I said, okay, well, we need to teach you how to tube feed these puppies. And mom looked at me and she said, I, I can't do this. I'm going back to work tomorrow. And dad looked at me and he said, I, I can't do this. I'm going back to work tomorrow. And there were two kids with him. And the older boy looked at me and he's like, mm -mm. and the little boy who couldn't have been a day over 12 was standing very quietly in the corner of the room. And he took one giant step forward and he said, I can do it. And I'm like, yes, you can. So I taught this little 12-year-old boy that day how to tube feed. He went home and he saved the rest of that litter. So if you think you can't do it, you really can. You really just have to sometimes grit your teeth and say, I'm going to learn to do this. I'm going to take all the right steps. I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to feed slowly. I'm going to make sure the puppy is warm. I'm going to make sure I pinch the tail before I feed. But you can learn to do this. I have taught Everyone that's walked through my door that wanted to learn how to do this, I've been able to teach to do it. So don't be so afraid of it. Realize you're going to be more likely to lose a puppy to dehydration or starvation than you will to a tube feeding mistake. Now, that doesn't mean tube feeding mistakes never happen because really sick, really weak puppies can still aspirate even if you do everything right. And you'll kick yourself if you do that. But realize that you're more likely to save a puppy than to lose a puppy. So you got to play the odds and you got to learn the techniques and you got to get the supplies, but the supplies are not expensive. For under $20, you can get set up to do this along with your formula. So figure it out, learn how to do it, and you will be rewarded by saving a lot of puppies' lives. Thank you so much, Dr. Greer, and thank you all for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day.